Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar on personality, ass personality assessment. How do you know if you're getting it right? I'm Jackie Barber. I'll soon be handing over to Jeff Tricky, who's Managing Director of Psychological Consultancy Limited, who's going to take you through the presentation. So Jeff is a chartered psychologist with over 40 years experience in personality assessment. He founded PCL nearly 25 years ago and he's overseen its growth ever since to establish its current global presence. So just a couple of housekeeping pointers before we get started. Um, we've muted all the lines um, just to reduce any background noise, um, but we'd love for you to ask questions. So please do so using the functionality on the right hand side of your screen um, and we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. And we'll also be circulating a copy of the slides and a recording um, of the webinar at the end um, via email. So look out for those. So now I will hand over to Jeff. Hello, everybody. Um, I've decided to divide this into two sections, this uh, webinar. The, um, the first part is going to be... Sorry, I'm having trouble with the mouse. There we go. So part part one is um, going to be story time. I'm going to. I want to just cover a couple of projects that we were involved in in the early days, which were very formative in uh, shaping our views about personality and the practical applications of it, and so on. I think you'll get the point, but it's, it provides a basis for what has what's going to follow. Okay, the first was, was a project with HMRC, well, HMC as it was then. Um, the issue uh, at HMC at that time was that the, the, the people who were employed, there were a lot of young, very bright graduates, but the process of um, advancement within the organization was very much a matter of how long you'd been there. So you had a lot of very restless, bright, capable people, lots of initiative, lots of drive, but who were couldn't see a, a, an opportunity, uh, not for years and years ahead, until they were, uh, you know, fairly ancient. So very, very unmotivating situation. Um, to address this, they'd had a, a national um, series of. Um, uh, think tanks, I suppose, to come up with uh, ideas about what it was that uh, you would success should be based on. They tried to find a sort of a template of capabilities, if you like, um, on, the, on which they would base some sort of initiative that would uh, be reassuring to these people. Um, the competencies that they had come up with are these on the screen now. So intellectual capability, self-awareness, drive for more, resilience, relationship management, organizational leadership, and results focus. So the first thing we did was spend a lot of time trying to work out what those actually meant. And of course, we were coming at this um, from the point of view of personality. And at that time, uh, we were using the HPI, uh, Hogan Personality Inventory specifically, and the scales within the uh, Hogan Personality Inventory on your screen on the right. So the task was, if we were going to use this, we had to be able to map this to the competences which were presented. And this was the first time we'd ever been faced with this. It was a, a very new challenge for us. Um, we actually had to sit and work out how you can take scores from different scales and combine them and give them the appropriate weighting to get us as near as possible to the, uh, the language that they had used in their competency framework. That's, that's really quite a, a challenging process, but it's also one for negotiation because we would define it in our terms um, and come to discuss it with uh, HMRC and to see whether that was what, how they would define it. So, I mean, obviously, you know, those definitions don't tell you, those titles don't tell you anything any more than the, the scale names of the HPI tell you very much. So it's very much a matter of looking at the content and seeing where the actual descriptive text was, would coincide appropriately. And that was the basis for that study. Um, this is the, the sort of shape, if you like, of the, the mapping, the results of the assessment process. 
And then for each of those competencies, a clear definition, and that definition was written in terms exactly of the elements of personality that were feeding into the competency. And the narrative text, similarly, was related to that. And so we, we needed this to be something that everybody would, all the decision makers in the various offices across England and Northern Ireland could use. And so it also, on a one pager with this graphic at the top, included a number of points that were possible uh, points for examination or further discussion at interview, and they appeared on the same sheet. So that was the first experience we'd ever had at mapping competencies in, in that sort of way. And this is just an example of one of them. You can see intellectual capability, and you think, well, what's that got to do with personality? And clearly there is aspects of intellectual capability which have nothing to do with personality. But from the personality point of view, we were looking at as the definition on the right says, we were looking at the non-cognitive factors that complement pure reasoning ability. So characteristics like being curious and analytic, having a wide interest, being an ideas person, but that combined with being realistic in their attitude to the world of work. In other words, not away with the fairies in terms of their imaginativeness and their curiosity, but more feet on the ground. And on the left, uh, at the bottom of the screen, examples of the kind of prompts that would appear on a report where that was appropriate, where scores would be perhaps particularly high or particularly low. And these would be drawn from the particular elements within that algorithm that was feeding into that competency rating. So in this case, is learning a low priority for this person? May they not be uh, fully, may they tend not to fully research issues? Are they not, are they not persistent in acquiring knowledge and to inform their conclusions. So that would be repeated for each individual, for each of the competencies. So what we'd learned about that was what we referred to as mixing the primary colors of personality. Personality is necessarily um, based on factor analysis of, of, of personality. So it's a, it's a reductive process. It's take, you take the, um, the actual complexity and richness of personality and you find out what are the key elements within that in terms of meaning that you are hoping to be able to assess. And that's what a personality test really does. Um, and we call those in the terms of the five factor model, for example, we refer to those as the primary colors of personality. What we had discovered, we think, or we felt, was a way of remixing those colors in different combinations that were appropriate for uh, a particular task or a particular competency framework. We could aggregate the scores on the original test, we could weight them uh, precisely, and of course once you've done this, what you're effectively doing is standardizing the interpretation process, because then you can research those algorithms and see whether or not they work. Um, from the client's point of view, it means you have finally incremented competency ratings. That's it's a lot better. I mean, it, they actually are T-scores in effect. Um, and that means they're very finely incremented compared with a typical five scale rating, subjective rating of competence, which is pretty much the norm. It's also uh, because it's now in, clearly in the domain of workplace language, it's something, the results and the whole process is much more accessible and understandable um, for the decision makers, which of course is the issue at the end of the day. It, they are the people who need to know and it's your ability to convey to them what the outcome of the assessment is that, uh, that everything hangs on, the success or failure of the whole exercise. The second story um, is an engineering company, Fine Tubes. They, they were going into organizational change process. Within Fine Tubes, they had a production line sort of arrangement so that the product would start at uh, one bench and it would move through the factory and pop out at the other end. And that was, it was decided, the new CEO at the time wanted to change that. He wanted leader, he wanted teams to work together. He wanted multidisciplinary teams. So they would organize things in that way so that one team was responsible from the project from beginning to end. Partly this was because 
it was becoming impossible to track down where things were going wrong because everybody would, you know, blame every other person along the production line if anything had gone wrong. It's that kind of a thing. It was very unaccountable. Um, so the, the that, that, this was the idea, and um, it meant that there were a lot of new posts in the organisation for new team leaders. So it was open to all employees, and that meant we had a huge number of assessments. Now, the problem with that was... First of all, we have multiple report writers. So we had profiles for all these individuals. Uh, we knew what it was that they, they wanted in terms of um, the competence for that role. We would discussed that with them. It was quite clear what they were. But trying to write reports when there are a group of you trying to write reports and having to continually confer and say, well, you know, what are you doing if it says high this, low this, medium this, or if this one's very high or that one's very low? So we would define and, and agree between us but the task of trying to be sure that you were being um, very consistent across all of you was extremely difficult and that a point we realized the necessity for those algorithms as it were to be written and recorded and for the terminology we use associated with the output of those um, algorithms also to be consistent so we would redefine the role, this is the solution, redefine the role in terms of competencies, like use the HMRC style competency algorithms, which we'd recently experienced, and then scripting the competency-based report text so that you could draw it together to compile reports for each individual. Okay. Um, so th that, these were very formative experiences, clearly, and they, in maximization of psychometric technique, we felt we, that, that there are limitations to psychometrics, and we considered that this was, a, well, inadvertently stumbled upon the fact that it was addressing a, a whole series of issues that we'd been only mildly aware of, or less, less definite than precisely aware of. It also was a, a process that encouraged full engagement with the decision makers. It gave them access to the information um, so that that whole process of going to talk to the board or the selection um, committee uh, about each of the candidates, which is completely, um, I don't know, fragile in, in, in terms of what impact the whole process of assessment is finally having on, on the process. Um, that was vastly improved. Everyone clearly understood the objectives of the common language. And of course, it was the blueprint for our profile match product. OK, part two. I want to now, this is the, the presentation, um, I, I guess, proper. What, what I was, want to say first is that, in my view, personality assessment is, is really quite exceptional these days. If you're using very good um, tools for the job, then they're, it's all based on, on very clear consensual information. The five-factor model is really the most dominant force within personality assessment globally. And it's had a huge influence. And it's, its rationale is absolutely clear. It's not you know, like other personality measures before it, which were based on this theory or that theory. Um, and the theories that were unprovable or disprovable, this is a very rational, coherent, logical way to approach it. Basically, just drawing from the entire vocabulary that we have to use to describe each other. And that's, that's the sort of foundation of it. It's highly reliable now. It's very replicable. Re replicable. There's a great deal of consensus. And of course, the richness and the meaning of it, because once you've got something stable, it begins to accrue more and more um, detail if just from the continuing ongoing research the amount of research now into five factor model is vast and the sort of influence that can have on the implications you can draw from the assessment is, is of course very very rich material so the objectives i guess in 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 assessment in personality assessment the first of all um, that we should have a very clear purpose. Why are we assessing these people? Is it that we are concerned about their fit with the culture? Is it about personal development? Is it about selection? Is it about um, succession planning and so on? I mean, you, you have to be you have a very clear reason why you're doing it, and that's going to affect both the way you go about it, the tools that you use, and so on. 
The second point I'll make, and this is just the same thing, but in a bit more detail, is knowing exactly what you're looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, then the chances of you finding it out of a, an assessment process is obviously going to be very problematic. You also need to be able to manage the input and the output. It's a matter of rubbish in, rubbish out. If you are approaching the assessment process uh, without that clear knowledge to uh, direct the process, the, the first two points, um, and unless you manage the output at the other end, that is conveying the results of the assessment to the decision makers, then you're adrift, aren't you? So the, the other point that we, that we always need to bear in mind is interpretational gift, drift. I mean, that's to do with the, the language that we have. The medium is the language that we speak and that it has to, to convey everything, however scientific and objective it starts out as. It depends at, how, at the end of the day how you communicate that. Um, and also it's vital to appreciate the limits of the objectivity of the process and what's the status of the information that you actually get out of personality assessments. Here are a little group of pitfalls, and I'm going to go into these in a bit more detail. The first I refer to as panora panoramic perspective. Um, I won't elaborate on these, we'll do it as we go, but subjectivity and inconsistency in interpretation, language of traits versus the language of work, the erosion of the science, which is the one that I find most upsetting in a way, because you've got, you've got a point where this, this, uh, these techniques have reached a real pinnacle, um, and they are also at a time when they're being misused and trivialized. And then finally, inappropriate expectations. Okay, so the panoramic perspective. I mean, the point about five-factor model is it is panoramic. It's, it's trying to encompass everything that, can you, can you, that you can possibly uh, encompass in terms of personality. So it's a, it's a very uh, broad spectrum, and that's great in one way. Its limitations are, though, that it's lacking in detail. I mean, if you, if you, well, it's a couple of things, points really. One is it's lacking in detail itself. So if you're covering everything, you know, the entire vocabulary and personality in one instrument, you need an awful lot of items in order to have anything in any great detail. You're getting very much a, a, a big picture. The point is, you the language that we, I think there's something like 3,000 words the la, in, the, in the language that we use to describe each other, this sort of personality or trait language. This is part of our everyday vocabulary. And um, if you look, break that down into manageable chunks, then most personality assessments will have something like 30, perhaps, different themes that feed into them, that sort of number. And they're all drawn from that um, framework of the, of the 3,000 plus words. And those themes in turn feed into the five factors. I'm assuming it's a five factor instrument. Or it would be equivalent if it's not. So you've got this sort of reductive process from the whole world of, of uh, our experience of personality being distilled down into five numbers in effect. And of course, a certain amount of detail about the underlying themes. Um, this isn't my analogy for this. I mean, if you've got a, a picture um, that is a lot of detail in it, if you want to zoom in on that detail, I suppose you want to look at Charlie Chaplin's eye in this case, there's just not enough information there for you to unpack it. Um, so I see personality assessment as a process in which the whole of our experience of personality is packaged down into this five-factor form, but you need some way to then... Uh, add water and stir and re, re, reconstitute the, the original um, personality or some of the richness of it. That's what you're trying to do. Um, the point with panoramic assessment is you can have just too much attention, but not enough, it's too much information, but not enough detail. This is uh, in our core really from knowing what it is you're looking for. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're open to all sorts of distractions once you open up the Pandora's box of an entire spectrum of personality. You forget that what you are actually looking for is quite specific. You think, this is nice, that's interesting, and so on. You've got an awful lot of stuff to confuse you. 
So what are the alternatives? Well, the alternatives are more focused assessments. That's feasible. You can have good measures that are not five-factor models that look at something else. They're a good measure, I think, of, of, of the emotion intelligence, for example. And we have one of risk type, which I think is very good. They have good credentials. They're built in the you know, usual psychometric way. And they, they re reflect, to some degree, the five-factor model. As long as you know what that relationship is, then that's fine. So the second alternative is that you acquire competency mapping skills, that you deal with uh, the problems in the same ways that we dealt with them at HMRC all those years ago. Um, or you use a competency structured tool like Profile Match. The second problem or issue is about objectivity. You know, we, we use psychometrics because it's measurement and because it has measurement characteristics and it achieves really remarkably good measurement. If you look at the basis on most major economic decisions, even medical decisions, the amount of actual objectivity in those is limited. So a huge, a huge amount of judgment always involved. And in fact, having you know, originally perhaps thought of psychology as something that is soft, in this respect, it's not. It's very hard. You know, psychometrics does achieve very high levels of reliability. But that objectivity is within the process. You know, when we, when we look at a review of a test, you're looking at, excuse me, <coughs> you're looking at the... Um, the data that's been collected in sort of, I suppose, experimental research sort of settings. And we know it's statistics, statistical characteristics. On the other hand, though, it's what the, the jobs that you're trying to appoint to are born within the world of work and they're born within the world of competencies. So inevitably, there's this judgment going on at the beginning of the process, whether it's a formal competency mapping process or not, but there's some sort of judgment going on about what that job requires in terms of personality. So that's the requirements end of it. Then you've got the detailed bubble of objectivity, if you like, the, the actual assessment process. And then you've got to take those results and you've got to convey them back to decision makers. So you've got to go from competency language to the language of traits and back to the language of work again. In all of that, you're trying not to lose any of the detail and any of the quality of the information. So the solutions to that then are various, but there are the, these are the issues. But you do need to be clear what you're looking for if you've got any hope of finding it. You can use job analysis to manage the input so that it's quite, your definition in terms of competence is relatively precise. You can competency map, the competency mapping we use in, in uh, in our case, it was relevant at both ends of the process. So it structured the input, and it also structured the communication at the end of the, of the assessment. And you need to be alert to the kinds of inferences you draw from a profile. I mean, this is a really critical point. We're going to address that again. This is language meaning and interpretation. You see, language is the source of um, and it's also the challenge of persons for, for personality assessment. If you want to say it's the source, positively speaking, it's the subject matter that is meaningful. It's the language that we use and those terms that we have developed uh, to describe each other are there because they're meaningful to us. Um, because they're a bit disorganized and they mean slightly different things to different people. But nevertheless, um, that's the content we're trying to convey in some way. The negative side of it is that language is so incredibly ambiguous and fluid, fluid in terms of its meaning. Words actually change, don't they, over a period of time. And in different communities, they mean different things. So it's a situation where the medium can distort the message very easily. I looked uh, up in a thesaurus at, at the, the four main five-factor uh, elements, if you want, or the five, the, five, the five factors of the five-factor model. So extrovert, the, uh, the extroversion is even less, but and if you talk about extrovert, then I, I found 20 synonyms for that. I found 28 for neurotic, I found 29 for prudence, 
24 for agreeable and 10 for openness. So when you think those, those that's to say there are, that's how many words there are in our language that say something very similar. But of course, they all have slightly different meanings. And that creates this kind of issue. This is what I call the semantic merry-go-round. In red here, you've got the five factors of the five-factor model. And on either side of them, you have got a synonym for that particular factor. So if I start at openness and go around clockwise, then outgoing is a characteristic of openness, which might lead you to think that they would be gregarious, which might lead you to think they're extrovert, which might think uh, leads you, lead you to feel they should be sociable, and then they should be friendly perhaps, which makes them agreeable. Can you see the language that you use can so easily slide from one focus to another. That's how interconnected the language we use actually is. It's a sort of cloud of meaning waiting for someone to put some structure on it. So the other point is that scale names, of course, are subject to this as well. I mean, the, the, the always the problem when people start off using personality questionnaires, isn't it? I mean, they, they take the scale names literally, they think, that if they know what that word is, they know what the test means, and of course that isn't the case. Label, there are labels of convenience. If you're creating personality questionnaire, the last thing you do is label the scale names. I can remember years ago um, faxing backwards and forwards to the States to Bob and Joyce Hogan when in the time uh, that they were developing the, uh, the dark side measure, the HDS. And the scale names for that were unsettled for ages. And even we, when we published the, the product here, we used one set of names. They used a different set. And gradually, uh, we were each changed. And now they're in alignment. So I mean, scale names are convenient. So they, they, no way a word can convey the richness of meaning within a scale. Um, what FFM does, though, is it structures something, a way of looking at this sea of ambiguity because it takes all the language and it distills it down to what are the underlying meanings, what are the essential five critical meanings uh, behind all of the language used to describe each other. That's, so it gives you an anchor, if you like, and it's a framework when you're discussing personality and the more you do it and the more you understand the five-factor model, that's its benefit. It's the benefit is it, it draws together the right language so that you're actually personality assessment is about knowing what is the right words to use to describe somebody. That's it and all about it. And the benefit of that is nothing else does it the same. Everything else is in this sea of ambiguity. So you have to beware then the semantic merry-go-round. That's the next point. And finally, there's, I've referred to this as trivialization, but it's a, it's a concern about the inappropriate use of personality measures and the inexpert use of them and the almost routine and ritual use of them. So those are the issues, really. It's to do partly with the internet explosion. Until that point, uh, there were quite rigorous controls on the use of personality questionnaires before there were any online. It was a one-on-one -on -one process. Usually it was a qualified psychologist who would be involved in the assessment. And if it wasn't, then it would be somebody who had trained to the appropriate professional standards of the country concerned, like the British Psychological Society here. Um, the internet explosion, of course, has, has removed all of that. You can find any questionnaire of just about a, 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 a myriad different kinds of personality questionnaire on the internet. There's been a similarly a growth in belief in the use of the test, so that's grown dramatically as well. At the same time, training requirements have been paired to the minimum. The reason being that nobody has the time. It's incredibly, we seem to live in a busier and busier world for all the progress that we're making. Um, and so the danger is, and the, the thing that worries me, at, the, at worst, personality assessment is used as a, uh, a ritual. It goes from being purposeful to becoming routine to being uh, the, the thing that you do every time there's a, an application. Of course, you go back to square one, and if that happens to be a very wide panoramic personality questionnaire, then you've got the burst of every possible world. And so in conclusion then, so 
I think the the issues discussed here are very widely relevant. It does whatever whatever personality test you're using, and whether you're using a five factor model or not. I mean, generally the general points I think hold. Um, these are the issues that inform uh, our approach at PCL, as described from the stories at the beginning of the session. Um, they're the principles that underpin our work, and it's the basis for our style of test development. And I guess it was the blueprint, in fact, for Profile Match 2, what is now Profile Match 2. So basically, do you know what you're looking for? If you don't know what you're looking for, your chances of finding it are remote. And within Profile Match, there's a job analysis survey which will help you with that if that's what you need. Um, the question of having too much information, that's going back to the panoramic information, uh, quality of information, which is uh, not detailed enough. Within Profile Match, uh, the numbers of items for any competencies are, are considerable, usually around 20 or more items for any competence. Um, and you focus, of course, on key competencies and not on the whole panorama. Um, does your process fit the need? In Profile Match, the, the whole system is configurable. You simply go into the system, you identify the competencies you want to assess, and the system builds the assessment for you. And finally, uh, are you focusing on the critical capabilities? So Profile Match then is multifunctional. And the, that's a list of the current, I think I've got them all, the, 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 uh, the various reports that are available out of that system. So job analysis, sifting, interview guide, selection, 360, coaching reports. But the main points here, though, I mean, that's our view, that's our product. But the main points hold for all kinds of assessment. And, they, and I think they're genuine concerns. And I think they genuinely uh, will influence the quality of information and value that you get out of using a personality questionnaire. I'll hand you back to Jackie now. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we've had a few questions come in, so we've got time um, to go through those. Um, so first of all, um, how do the personality factors get translated into competencies on Profile Match? Oh, on, well, on Profile Match, we have developed a, a, a library of, of competencies, and they're all uh, based on algorithms. So um, what we've done is they're, they're designed. They're proprietary and they're designed. So we use our expertise over all those years, and we create the output that we would, the conclusions that we would come to if we were doing that on a one-to-one on one -one basis. So we look at the various elements of, of personality. We, uh, within Profile Match, there are 10 scales. It's a five-factor model questionnaire that underpins Profile Match. Um, but we had 10 scales in order to begin the process of getting down to the, the level of granulation we wanted to get back to, rather than five. So there's one step in that direction is taken in the questionnaire itself. And then there are uh, something like 15, 16 items in every scale there, and all of those then will, would, are available to feed into the questionnaire. And when you pick the competencies you want, it selects the appropriate scales out of the 10 for the assessment. So the assessment is tailored from the beginning. And the, the way that, that they, uh, the, the various scales will, will impact on a particular competence is that we first of all identify what's the scale is relevant, and then we identify what proportion of the interpretation for that competence should rely on that particular scale. Um, and so it's that, that's what the algorithm consists of. It combines the scores, it weights them accordingly, and it comes up with a rating for that particular competency. Okay, thank you. Um, how many people should ideally participate in a job analysis survey? Oh, well, the job analysis survey, I would say, is in terms of um, profile match, it's not essential. If you know what competence you're looking for, you just select, select the competences and then email the, um, the candidates. But if you need a job analysis survey, if you want help with that, and it, the value of it is that you can include a lot of people in it. Um, I think we... we I mean, something you can use, one person can do it. It's a process to just challenge your own thinking about the job. If you go through the job analysis survey, it asks you to what extent 
is it important for this person to communicate well with others? To what extent is it important? So on. So you've got a series of questions that structure your thinking. So for one person, it will achieve that. It, you can then send the same, ask a lot of other people to complete the same job analysis survey. You simply go into, into the system, label it. This is a job analysis survey for whatever is the role. You get an email and you send it to whoever you want to participate. And then they complete it too. And the, and the system then will collate those, those re responses. But you can see, if you're, if you're working with Profile Match, you'll know this, but you can, you can go to, into the system and have a look at your job analyses and open it. And you can see uh, which people have contributed. And you can, make, you can take as many reports as you like. You can take one for each participant, or you can have one that's for everybody. Or you, sometimes what we have done in the past is have one which is for people who are incumbents in the job, people who know the job, and another report for people who are managing managers or supervisors, um, and uh, as contrast them. The, the, the best use of all, in my experience, has been where you go back with the job analysis to the client and discuss it with them and have a, the decision-making group within the organisation discuss it. So you, you involve them in the final selection of competences in that way. Sorry, but no, yeah, it's probably, you could have too many, obviously it becomes unmanageable, but you know, if you've got four, five or six people, it's very interesting. And you can see how they compare and contrast and where they agree and what the consensus is. In the end, what the report is, it just takes all of that information and puts it in rank order. So it tells you which is the competence which most people have identified in, in, through their answering of those questions. And then you make your choice and selection from that information. Okay. And, and so another one here, you've talked about um, the importance of interpretation. Do you need to be trained to use a competency-based assessment? I think the first and foremost, you need to be trained in how to use the system. So that's, that's not negotiable, it has to be the case. Um, something like ProFormats, because it starts with competences and ends with competences, how much you want to get under the bonnet and have a look at the mechanics of it and understand the mechanics of it is another matter. It's obviously desirable. The more I think you know about personality, the more better use you, you, you put the information to. You understand how much influence is involved, how much judgment and how much objectivity. Um, but it's very usable at a much more modest level than that. Generally speaking, anybody who's had any experience of any other personality uh, questionnaire we wouldn't, wouldn't have any problem with it at all. Um, what we do here is we tend that, but by and large, people who are using ProFormats are people who are already trained in one way or another with personality assessment. But we also give a lot of support here to newcomers. And people who are just signing up, we, we take them through the process. <coughs> Sorry. Great. Okay. Um, so those were all of the questions that we had um, through. A um, couple of points here. Um, if you want to conduct a job analysis survey, you can actually do that um, free by setting up an account um, on Profile Match, and there's the URL there. And that allows you to actually go through the process and, and conduct a job analysis survey. Um, and if you would like to talk to us about Profile Match 2 or any of the other assessments um, that we have, then please do contact us um, on the email address there or call us directly. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be circulating a copy of the recording of this webinar um, together with the slides. So um, watch out for that. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. And um, thanks very much, Jeff. Goodbye.